Okay, good morning and welcome to our first session. Uh, my name is Jeff Child. I'm a product of the Stanford Hospital System. I was born here and uh, I'm a member of the Community Health Council, which is uh, helping to promote Stanford's uh, health care to the community and, and all the things that Stanford offers. Um, it's great to see everybody here for this session, and I think uh, we're going to learn a little bit about hopefully how not to come to the hospital, uh, let's talk about injury prevention, which I think is important to everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jason Drago. He is uh, the Associate Professor of orthoped Orthopedic excuse me, um, Surgery and the Head Physician of the Stanford uh, football team. Uh, he also uh, divides his time amongst a number of things, including clinical work, uh, the surgery suite, research, his work in the human performance lab, and then, as I mentioned, the care of Stanford athletes. So he's the team physician for Stanford. Uh, he's also the team physician for the U.S. Olympic Committee and the U.S. ski team. So, and one other thing I want to just remind you is there is a book in the back that he has put together. Please make sure you get one of these when you notice the copyright on it. It's 1993, so Jason's been at this a long time. So I encourage everyone to listen, and uh, please welcome Jason. Thank you. There we go. Good. Well, number one, thank you so much for coming today. I think this is uh, an interesting topic, an interesting topic to be given by a hospital for the same reason Jeff said, is that the main portion of this is how do you really maximize your health and the safety of your exercise and avoid coming to the doctor's office. So that's going to be a big part of what we have learned over the years and the big part of what we want to share. We want to share a little bit of exciting news because our field of sports medicine has come such a long ways. Uh, over the past 10 years, and especially over the past five. Things that we used to dream about in the laboratory, one of my other hats, um, you know, is stem cell medicine. Well, gosh, this 2015, it's here. Wow. You know, and I would have never guessed that um, when we started this, you know, right around uh, 10 years ago. And then finally, at the end of this, um, I think it's going to be some of the best time. And that's just time for us to chat together. Close doors here, any topics you want to talk about. Um, and that includes the prevention and performance and what's it like to train athletes at the uh, elite uh, level. Um, what about stem cell medicine? We have so many topics that we can talk about together. So we want to spend a, you know, enough time to make sure all your questions are answered. So that's what's on tap for this morning. Okay, so the question is, where did all this stuff come from and these new theories about how to be safe and to maximize performance? Where does it come from? Well, any Stanford football fans here? Yeah. What's going on, right? When I came here in 2006, this was our win-loss. I'm sorry, you got cut off there. Wins are in this column. Losses are in this column, 2006. And one of my jobs was to come here and take care of the football team. And when I got here, I said, oh my gosh, this is going to be a really long career. <laughs> and it was amazing that, w that during the football games, at the end, I had to be on the field so much and take care of so many injuries. By the end of the, day, end of the game, I had to ask the coaches, did we win or lose? I had no idea. Because I was so busy doing the job of, of really taking care of the athletes that were hurt, it was a spectacle. Right? It was a track meet, as I would say. And then look what's happened over the years. I mean, this is a real amazing transformation, isn't it? Uh, for those that you follow it, and Stanford being a football powerhouse in the United States, really? I mean, really? Being one of the most physically tough teams in all of college football, Stanford? Really? How did this come to be? Now, I want to tell you, amongst this journey, and the success that has blossomed from this, I don't mean to misrepresent. I mean, obviously, we've had some of the best coaches that have come here to college football. And you've heard all about them. We still do. It's amazing. And probably the single most important reason for this dramatic uh, transformation that now we're writing books about because it's just such a fantastic change. Uh, the other thing, of course, is good coaches. Then you get better athletes. So of course, it's the athletes that are performing. But there's something else that's going on, and that's what I want to share today, because we've learned a lot about this, and a lot we can take home in our own lives, in our own training. 
And that has to do with this absolute philosophical difference in the way that athletes are being trained. And I'm going to give you a couple of highlights of this. And these same things that were taken and, and put into the football program and to the rest of Stanford athletics are the same things that we can take home into our own lives and our own training. And that is that, that we got it, I think, wrong when we started lifting weights and training these athletes because we weren't training the athletes for what they were supposed to do. And the same thing, when we go and we go to the gym, we start lifting our bench press, and then we start thinking, but is the bench press going to really help us in any way in our lives and prevent more or, or actually maximize our resiliency? And I think the answer is no. But, but this has been interesting because when we make a more resilient athlete and a more powerful athlete, look what's happened to the injury rate. This is incredible, right? We didn't even expect it. I mean, that was our goal, but we didn't expect it to be like this. Now I measure the times that I have to go on the field in number of times per season rather than amount of times per game. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. I could watch the game, and it's the best seats in the house. I don't have to worry, <clears throat> besides the occasional injury. It's dramatic. Right? And at the same time, what's happened to athletic success? Right? Also skyrocketed. <clears throat> so there's something to this. Right? And there's some, so let's explore this. And let's explore how this dramatic transformation has occurred. Let's look at this first dichotomy here of, of, of training of athletes and the same principles I'm going to say we should all take home from this talk. This is University of Alabama on the left crimson tide here. Number one, um, for the most part, football powerhouse. <clears throat> this is their gym and their training facilities. This is their philosophy. We are going to push a lot of weight because we're going to push people around. But look at the way that this is designed. And again, sorry, there's two screens, so it's hard for me to point. But look at all of the racks, right? Look at all the machines. You see the machines? Sorry if everyone look over here. All the way, it's lined up, right? The racks, they're lined up. What are the racks and the machines designed to do? They're designed to push something against gravity. That's what they're designed to do. But when you design something like this, you can only move against the weights against gravity. And it's typically in one plane. So the question is, is that how you play any sport? Is that how you play football? Is that how we should train ourselves when we go to the gym? So we think the answer is no. That's not getting us anywhere. So look at the difference. I just is a stark contrast. Here's a brand new gym, football gym at Stanford. Where's all the racks? They're gone. Where's all the machines? Well, there's a couple of Pilates reformers in the back for flexibility. But look at all this open space. Look at all the dumbbells. Look at all the kettlebells. Look at all the medicine balls. This is an entirely different, a dramatic transformation in taking care of athletes. And it really works. I'm going to show you why. So the first thing that we do when we're designing programs and we're training the athletes <clears throat> is that we realize that there's a list of things that tends to create injury and problems with the human body. And it all stems really from this list. And the first thing on the list is developing our understanding of limb asymmetry. When we're born, Mother Nature made us pretty much carbon copies, right? Right and left side. When we look, it's pretty much the same. And you know what? Anatomically, it is. But what we see when we evaluate movement and evaluate strength and flexibility, it's totally different in some folks. And we also understand that those same some folks who have a right side that's markedly different to the left side are the ones that tend to get injured. The other thing we see is that through watching all these years of gory injury films, and we see them on ESPN, and we can even see them all over the internet, we've learned from that. We take those videos to the laboratory. We analyze, why did this happen, right? They've done this, this layup millions of times. Why did all of a sudden the knee or the fracture or something occur? Why is it? And we've understand, well, when we collected about hundreds of thousands of these, that they all have things that are in common. And they are the risky movement patterns that have now been identified. Great. ACL tear, oh, what a traumatic thing. We all hear about it, but now we know why. 
We know how to prevent it now because of all these years of experience. So we can take that same information on our own careers and our own health and fitness and practice doing the less risky things, right? Be prepared for multidirectional movement. Well, by far the number one thing that comes into the clinic. Number one. And here's a typical story. 40-year-old ultra triathlete. I've been training five days a week. I have run marathons, I have Ironman triathlons. I spend about three hours per day biking, running, and swimming. And all of a sudden, I'm injured. I said, well, geez, this sounds like you've really been training. <clears throat> Excuse me, you're really strong. And I said, oh, yeah, well, what happened is my buddy called me up, and we played tennis. And then we played tennis, and I tore my Achilles tendon. And then, so let me ask, is anyone in the room surprised at that result? I'm not. I'm not. And maybe we shouldn't be. Why? Well, triathlons and marathons. We're running in a straight line. We're biking in a straight line. We're swimming in a straight line. And then we play tennis, which is anything but a straight line. We haven't practiced or prepared our body for multidimensional movement. So if we're going to be doing that, if we're going to take that aerobics class and we're training before and getting ready by running, not such a good idea. It's not going to get us there. And same thing, jogging and preparing for your tennis is not going to take care of it, right? So we've got to practice multidimensional movement if that's what we're going to do as humans. The other thing is be prepared for the movements of sport. Some of you come in and say, hey, look, I don't care about anything else. All I want to do is golf. That's it. That's what I want to do. I said, fine. How are we going to design a program for you to maintain your ability to play golf and to improve your performance? And the answer is, we're going to mimic the movements of sport and practice them because golf is very unique. And if you go out and you lift weights and then you play golf, those are opposite, right? So, so we're not practicing. We're not getting better at golf. We're not practicing the movements. And so that is what is necessary. It's the same philosophy as Stanford football. All we did is change it and saying, why are we lifting against gravity? You don't do that in football, right? And I'm going to say the same thing. Whatever sport we choose, we've got to practice the movement patterns within that. And that makes us much more resilient. OK, so here's the, here's the list of the things we got. It's the opposite of the previous list. How do we do this? Well, the first thing we want to do is become symmetrical. It's the first thing we all have to identify. So the question is, well, how do we know how we're moving? It's really hard to look in the mirror when we lift weights and when we move and when we do our flexibility on the mat. Are we really symmetrical? Well, there is a secret uh, to doing this. And it's a set of, of seven exercises that have been developed. This is widely distributed throughout the United States. So this is nothing that just pertains to Stanford. But we use it as our cornerstone of understanding of our elite athletes. And I'm here to say you should use it as the cornerstone of your own athletic path, regardless of what that is. And this is a list of seven things that you can do that's easily achievable and easily monitored by either your workout instructor, a physical therapist, or of course today, which I'm going to tell you in a couple minutes, our athletic trainers right outside the door. And they can have an assessment for you today to understand your degree of flexibility, symmetry, strength, and command of your body movements. That's what this is about, right? It's making you symmetrical. And, and so it's a great thing. Let me just show you in this. And everyone can, again, because we have split screens, look on this screen. And you look at, watch the wand, watch the angle here of this rod. Okay, He has his right foot forward, right? And watch how this wand here, which is symmetrical. Now watch what happens now. He puts his left foot forward, and all of a sudden the rod is much more upright. It's the way this exercise is supposed to be. But you see, he was wildly different in his right and left side. So here he's going to measure his amount of movement, a flexibility. And you see there's a wide discrepancy. Do you see how much different the space in between his figures? I'm going to run this tape at the same time now. And I just want you to appreciate this athlete here on the right screen, how whenever he does something on one side and puts his foot forward, everything is the same. Sorry, it goes kind of fast. But everything is exactly the same. The distance between the two, the distance between the two arms, and it's just a very, everything's symmetrical, straight up and down. 
And again, you can kind of just look there. These are looping around, but it's really easy to see. But for us, when we're exercising, it's really tough. So that takes a, a second eye to identify this. And again, the first step on getting your body ready for exercise and decreasing your chance of injury. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to share all of it with you guys today, okay? And so what we have is one of the stations, and I'm gonna be the first to apologize. When you go out to the court out there, it is not easily found because the sign you can't even see. It's around the corner, and I hope we're gonna have that fixed. And I've talked to a couple people, but still, it's really hard to see. So, so it's in the one that says clinical trials. It's in the corner without the sign that, that you can see. Okay, but there has been a line, so people have found it. Okay, but I encourage you guys all to go there because we have the certified trainers who really know what they're doing to, uh, to analyze each one of you, right? And to give you a recommendation on kind of what's wrong. So you can take that, and whether you take that to your healthcare professional or your trainer, or just pay attention to the differences uh, in the two sides of your body, um, at least it's a start on the road to do that. So you can feel free to do that, and it'll be running all morning uh, uh, today. Second is avoiding these risky movement practices. This is the analysis of all that video on how this occurred in the first place, right? So I'm going to give you two athletes. Again, these are two athletes jumping. Okay, it's going to go back and forth. They're going to keep jumping for us here. Okay, and we're going to analyze here. The athlete on the left is the one that has a very risky pattern that we have identified. The one on the white is landing safely. Now, we always land when we're doing things, whether it's CrossFit and jumping from a box, or we're jumping down from a curve, or we're playing, uh, jumping up for a frisbee at the park. We're always doing this, right? So the question is, how do we make it safe, and how can we practice doing so? Well, watch. Watch on the left side, please. Watch what happens, and please watch the knees of this athlete to the left. Do you see that? Do you see how the knees are landing? Watch the athlete on the right. You see how the, the legs go straight up and down, the knees are straight forward, and the knees don't come in to touch each other like the left? That's a very risky thing to do because it has an extreme increase in the load of the ACL as well, as well as the other structures of the lower extremity and the knees. So we know that it's bad. And so landing with the knees collapsed is risky, and we can identify it. Landing with legs straight is a much safer practice to do. And again, it just takes a little practice in understanding what we should do and what we shouldn't. Look at these two athletes here again, okay? They're gonna keep jumping for us. One of these is safe and one of these is a very risky pattern, okay? And so we need to collectively here look at these and see the differences between this because we can learn from these two. One's at high risk for injury and the other one's not. Do you see what's happening on the left side? where the athlete is jumping down and you see lands and there's shock that's absorbed, as you can imagine, throughout the entire leg. It's a little bit in the calf muscle, a little bit in the quadriceps, a little bit in the hip, a little bit in the core. Look at this side, where there is no shock absorption. It's almost like a uh, shock absorber in a car that doesn't work, right? And you go over a rock and like, whoa, what was that? Well, there was no shock absorber. Right? And so shock absorption throughout the chain of events in lower extremity and very rigid knees where they don't tend to absorb the shock. The ankles don't tend to absorb the shock. It's just a stop. And then all the shock is absorbed up here in the trunk as the trunk goes way forward here, as you see. Okay? So then we know that that's another risky pattern. Absorbing throughout the extremity is the way we need to land and to cut. Uh, when we're doing our dynamic activities and landing with stiff joints, et cetera, when we're doing activities is very risky. The third is to use unconstrained, multi-directional movements when we can during a training process. It is the building block to a resilient body and athlete. The reason is because we're humans and we don't do things in one dimension. Period, end of story, we just don't do that, right? We're all over the place in a good way, right? And so then we can't practice things doing in one dimension to be successful. Sorry about that, so ignore the uh, talking. Um, but here is somebody who's doing a famous thing. What, what is this called, the plank, right? You can do planks and bridges. It's one of the most common things that are done, okay? This is what we're trained to do. It's very successful. Look at the athlete on the right. This is another core strengthening exercise with a dumbbell but watch the different dimensions that she goes through during this time to do her core. 
to see how it takes the whole body. It takes the whole body getting involved with this in multiple dimensions to get strong. And then she is going to be much more resilient to developing an injury compared to the athlete here who is strong in that one dimension. But what happens if it's over on its side and you twist a little bit? He's not prepared for multidimensional movement. So therefore, when we're designing our exercise program, we need to have, like the athlete on the right, compared to the movement patterns of the athlete on the left. Right? It just doesn't work. And this is exactly what we've done with the football team. All right, finally, use exercise that mimics your sport, as we were talking about. Be prepared for the things that you want to do and practice them. One of the most glaring examples, I think, again, is this football example. And I just want to, 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 to show you the difference. I'm sorry for the video, I'm sorry the noise. But here, this is tradition. Yell and scream as loud as you can, lift 600 pounds against gravity. That makes you a good football player, right? Wrong. When do we do that? When are we lifting up another football player? It's not part of the sport, right? What do we do on this side? Sorry. And I want to, if we can, go back here, because these are supposed to be looping. So watch what happens to the Stanford football players. We're pushing cars, right? This is a small car, OK, as he's done. So we're lifting against gravity. And with football, we're pushing people out of the way. Push the car out of the way, right? Load it up with a bunch of weights and push the car because you're trying to displace another player. If you are swinging on the golf course, okay, then do the movements that you need on the golf course. Don't do biceps and bench presses and bridges because you're not doing that with your sport. It's not going to get you the resilience that you need to be successful, and you're having a higher chance of getting injured. Do you see the philosophical change? This is way different than it used to be. And you have to have a little faith to throw out the things that are so commonplace. Even when that trainer comes and says, OK, now what I want you to do is do five reps on this machine. You're like, uh-uh. Nope. No, we're on a new dimension now. This is a new level here. So this is going to take some time to filter, but the success has been shown. Yes? Yeah, great question. The, the question is, is there special trainers that are certified and identified in this new way of training? Well, yes and no. Number one, the yes part. The yes part is the certification of the functional movement screen. There's a way to do it and a way to record it so we can all talk the same language. And I guess there's a good part, right? The good part is, when you get your score, right, when you're identified what's wrong, there is identified ways to take care of the deficiencies. That's the benefit of the certification or somebody who knows what they're doing so you can correct right, the things that are wrong. Now, what's this whole new method of training? The answer is no. There's no way to say, hey, you know, how do you train athletes or whatever? But it becomes an apparent on the first visit. That's what I say. And there is no training for this. This is, I would just label this, that this is an educated, progressive trainer who really knows what they're doing. That's when you know I've arrived at the right spot. And no, we don't have a list, I'm sorry. And that, that field of trainers um, and athletic specialists changes so much, the hospital couldn't dream of keeping up with something like that for recommendations. But at least we have the knowledge of how to identify it. So if we get to a place and we say, I don't think we're quite where we need to be, we can move on. And I think that's the biggest thing. But the certified functional movement screen is a place to start. And that should be easily identifiable by looking at that particular health specialist. Case, case closed. And, and if, if, you know, taking it forward, how many gyms look like University of Alabama? Almost all of them. Right? We're the only ones. Maybe there's another one that's creeping in now that they're saying, oh my gosh, what's going on, wrong with, well, on with Stanford here? And why, when we have all our meetings, everyone comes into the Stanford rooms and say, well, what is this? What's going on? How do I? How, how, how can we be different, you see? So it's, it's catching on throughout you know, the United States. But it's going to take a while, and we should just be the first, right? We're in Silicon Valley, right? We should be on the, the, the cutting edge of all of this. Um, OK, 
So that's a couple of ideas. I hope during our chat time that if you have any additional questions, then let, let's talk about them, okay? Because there's a lot to this. Um, but those are the principles. I, I want to also just say one thing, because it's the thing I'm, I've asked probably the most out of anything, is that maybe, I'm just guessing, some of you came in here to see if there's any breakthroughs that Stanford has of a new amino acid, a new supplement, a new enzyme, or something that can make us train better and be more efficient bodies, right? And I think maybe I've disappointed you in a major, major way if that was the goal. But here's the reality. They don't work. That's, that's the real truth, right? It's deliberately not part of this program. It's deliberately not part of our athletic program. It's deliberately not part of the Olympic program. It's deliberately part of the governing bodies of sports such as the ski team, et cetera. Why? Right? There is college um, weight rooms that were built around a pharmacia kind of counter where you go for all your protein powders and amino acid mixes, and almost all of them have disappeared, and now it's a Gatorade station, because we know that all of those things just tend not to produce the resilient body. And so that is that I just wanted to explain it because there's always somebody say, oh, this is what I really wanted to hear, and I want to know what I could buy at GNC, and I say, good news, save that money. Save it. Buy something else, right? Buy that athletic, uh, that, that physical trainer who really knows what they're doing. That's going to get you a lot further in your athletic career. But there's times, regardless of what we do, and this includes high-level uh, athletics, that b despite having 70% or so decrease in the injuries, injuries still do happen, right? It's just the reality of this. And, and a lot of questions people have is like, okay, well, what happens then? Uh, what happens then? What's the current state of affairs here in sports medicine? And so I just wanted to share a couple of things with you. First thing we learned is, is that these trials and how to improve performance and function and resiliency has started at the lead at level. And we have that opportunity because of the unique situation of Stanford taking care of most of the peninsula's uh, uh, professional teams, the, uh, again, the, the teams of the, uh, the ski teams and the uh, high level of athletic department that we have here. So we've been able to learn a lot. And then we can optimize things. And then when we know that we're getting the best results because we're attempting to optimize it, then we know that that's what we should do. And so we treat everyone like that. What, why would we do something different? Why would we have a different type of technique for, let's just say, a weekend warrior or someone comes into clinic? That wouldn't make any sense. We spent all this time trying to figure it out, right? So that's number one, is that this is, these are the algorithms that we all go by. There's no difference between the way that we would take care of any injury that happens in our, any of our other clinics compared to in our elite athlete clinics. It's the same thing. It's been through a lot of revolution, but it's now the same thing. And that's an interesting thing um, that's come about. Second, is this understanding of the human body, which I think most of it could say, come on, doctors, you should have known this a long time ago, and I agree. The problem with surgery is that this is a complex thing that takes so many steps and so many things to worry about that what we end up doing is we saying, well, okay, we're going to fix the cartilage in your knee. Great, thank you very much. We fix the cartilage in your knee. But what we realize is that we don't get the best results doing that doesn't work, let's be frank, right? So it's one step in the right direction because you can't be, have a full body if you have a hole in your cartilage or you have a meniscus tear. But that's not it, right? Because what happens when we're injured is we develop all of these other maladaptive patterns that you can't really see unless somebody's watching you and saying, that's not how you walk, that's not how you move your hips. You're substituting this muscle for the other one. And so we don't get the body right. So yes, we took care of the meniscus tear. Yes, we're not fully better. Why? Because we didn't do number two here. We didn't look at you. We didn't follow through. We didn't correct the things, other things in your body that were wrong. It's the way to get results, I'm here to say today. Okay, it's it. The meniscectomy and the ACR reconstruction will not be enough to get you back. Newsflash. Okay, it's going to take getting your whole body ready to do this uh, in the future. Second, this is the cool part for me, right? And this is from the laboratory. Now we have more to offer when before it was like, oh, geez, I'm sorry. Uh, we have nothing else to offer you. Time for knee replacement. Now we have more. So these are these new level treatments, of course. And these new level treatments are interesting because of how long we have come with the science of this. 
And so now this is a great time in, in Stanford here because in a lot of different disciplines, this is the first year where stem cell trials are now ready for humans. And the animals have well accustomed to those in the past and now it's our time. Our time has come. So we're starting just in a couple of months now, the first stem trials in the United States, stem cell trials for the treatment of cartilage injury. So it's really interesting and uh, fascinating. Um, two, um, we're realizing that we can use different types of cartilage transplants and, and we can do them in a way now that's arthroscopically and minimally invasive. So we have options is what we're saying. And number third, we have some biologics. A lot of us have heard of platelet-rich plasma or PRP. Why have we heard about it? Because it's all over the news, right? And so-and-so basketball athlete has gone to Timbuktu to get her PRP treatment and great. And then the question that I'm sure you're going to ask is, that, does that really work? And my real answer is not really. So then the question is, how can we use something that's so powerful, such as growth factors in this PRP, how can we make it work? And that's what we're doing here, which is different. So let's go through a couple of these things together. First is what to expect with the stem cell. What, what is this whole thing? And so the bottom line is that these are all done minimally invasive to harvest the stem cells. And then it's kind of a cool thing. We take a, a little blood and we make biologic glue. And those glue is the thing that glues the stem cells in, and we place them on a home or a little doormat, so to speak, that keeps the cells there to patch the hole. And this trials, these trials are comparison to the gold standard, which is microfracture getting the stem cells from immediately below this area uh, in the bone marrow. Here's what it looks like, minimally invasive uh, surgery. So you can't see, of course, any blood or anything. It's tiny little holes, and all of this is accessed through that. Here's what the stem cells look like. There's two little portions um, after it has been harvested for what it's worth, just so you know that. And what happens is here's the doormat. Here's the little areas that hold the stem cells, and they're placed into the defect, just like this. So that's how it goes. It's patching a hole with biologically relevant tissue to regenerate it. And it's a huge step. The best part of this whole step, what's the best part? The best part is this is all things from your human body, yours. Right? It's yours. It's your cells. It's your glue. And that's, gonna, that's the key to, number one, safety. Right? And number two, FDA, what's what I care about. And number three, I think results. Right? It's all compatible with your body. This is what we're chasing after. This is what we see on the internet. This is Korea and their trial of stem cell medicine. So they've already done similar things. This is for arthritis. Just to point out on here, here's bone-to-bone -bone arthritis. You see how this looks like, uh, uh, um, what color is that, tan color? Uh, over here, tan color, and, and it's supposed to be white. It's supposed to be white all over. And so what they did in Korea is inject stem cells into this arthritic knee, and it regenerated. And you see, after six months, they went back in to look, and all of these areas that were bone-to-bone -bone are now cartilage. Every, everywhere you look, everywhere you look, there is dramatic photos and results of stem cells. The problem, the problem is these aren't done scientifically. For all we know, this could have been one in a hundred. No idea. I'm not denying that they got these results, but I am questioning, well, how, 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 can we, how often does this really occur? Um, and is this really true? And so that's the difference. It, the difference is we're doing this scientifically, right? We're just not saying, hey, here's, you know, let's charge some money and here's this, and oh, I hope you do well, thank you very much. Who's next? It's, are we really being responsible for these stem cells? Are we really ensuring that these are working? And that's the difference of what we're doing here in the United States. Um, but this is what we're after, okay? This is clearly what we're after. We can also get stem cells from bone marrow, okay? And this is a way to do it. And I just want to show you that this is actually really easy to do in the clinic, and it's kind of like getting a shot. Um, the doctor, of course, numbs up a, a little bit, and then get your stem cells just like that. So it's, it's pretty easy, and it's amazing. I, I think for most people, say, oh, gosh, this is going to hurt really bad. And the answer is no. We've been doing this for years uh, of doing it. So we have multiple ways of getting stem cells from our body to use in this sort of biologic medicine. Um, one of the things we know is that that young cartilage has this resiliency, right? The resiliency to grow. And so we can get some cartilage that is from very young donors. And when we do so, we know that it works better than most of us in the room. 
Okay? And why? Because there is that regenerative capacity uh, when we're young. And so if we do that, then we need to harness its potential. And what does it mean for us practically? It means we have choices. You know, we have choices. Do we want to use our cells? Do we want to use other cells? We know that just taking my cartilage and putting it in your body uh, doesn't work so great for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it does. Um, but, but what we really want is we want to increase the efficiency of our treatment. And so we know that there's new ways that we have to be able to do it. And now we could be doing this minimally invasive, which is the difference of the Stanford. Lots of people have access to this, but we are the ones now are doing minimally invasive. And so that's been the goal, right? That's been the goal of this whole time. So that's the changes. Question, sir. Yeah, great question. Is there a limit to the age that you can use these procedures to regenerate cartilage? And the simple answer is no, right? Uh, for many reasons. Now let's just take this one. This is maybe identifying a body type that, that, that doesn't have maybe good capacity for regeneration. Fine, we have options. We can give young tissue so then the other surrounding tissues, or let's just say with that body stem cells is not enough, we, then we have options. So no age limit clearly on this because we're transplanting younger tissue. What about, um, um, what about an age with stem cells? Well, sometimes some types of these stem cells do decrease with age and some do not. So that's a conversation with your surgeon and physician saying, okay, here's all the scenario, here's you, what are my options? And that's a relevant one. Okay, well, uh, your age is 65. Okay, fine. Then we're going to have these options. I'm 30. Okay, well, we have these options. right? And that is all part of it. So there is yes and no to your answer because some of the things do matter with age and some do not. But the important thing, I think, is that we have options regardless of your age. Great, great question. The question is, a patient is chronologically in their 80s, but they are really active, and they really are taking care of their body, they're really physically fit as we have outlined before, they look like they're 60, and in a way, you know, 80 is the new 60, right? So their physiologic age is different than their chronological age. And the question is, does that particular patient fare differently with biologics or with any sort of surgery or a human body intervention? And it is clearly the answer is yes. That is a clear, and now we're really escaping the knee and we're really escaping biologics and we're escaping orthopedic surgery and we're going back to the heart and lung and ability to have uh, any sort of procedure. How, how do you do? How does the 80 year old, 80 physiologically, 80 year old, 60 physiologically, how do they do? They are entirely different. And outcomes, risk of something happening, totally different. And so yes, what is our goal? Our goal is to turn back the physiologic clock because there's no turning back, obviously, the chronologic. And so that is a key thing. Thank you for that question. That's the summary. Thank you for that great summary because that's what we want to do. That's the whole goal of preventative medicine and longevity medicine right there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, quick question. Um, could you also go back a little bit to the arthritis issue? Yeah. And I know in our family, we have uh, elders in their 80s who are going through these complete joint replacements. Yeah. And my question is, for myself, I look at the heredity, and I'm athletic, I'm f pretty fit, but am I inevitably going to get arthritis and have to replace my joints? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could address the progress in yeah, that. Yeah, great, great question. Everyone hear the question? Yeah. And so that is, are we just predisposed? You know, well, what about taking care of our heart? Does it really matter? Because genetics are the things that are really going to matter. Well, more so, I think, with the heart, you know, and that, that there is a certain genes, and that's what the whole cardiologists are looking for. What are these things that we can alter in genetic medicine? 
Um, we know that genetics, as far as arthritis, is a smaller portion of the, of the reasons that arthritis occurs. Lots of hundreds and hundreds of thousands, it's now into the millions, of people have been gone through huge studies in you know, Framingham and the, and the Scandinavian databases to understand what is it that predisposes to osteoarthritis. Does anyone know, with all of those studies, I think pretty much without exception, the number one thing that tends to cause arthritis? Does anyone know? Guesses? Yeah? No, but great guess. Yes? No, great guess. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes. Weight per frame. It's the number one thing. Obesity or semi-obesity or carrying around too much force for the body that you have that Mother Nature made. Our frames are all different. Our bone capacity and our cartilage capacity is different, right? But if we have less capacity and you put more weight on, not going to work long time. It's the number one thing on every list. Everyone, to avoid arthritis or decrease your chance of it occurring. Now, second. Second is injury, right? And that may or may not be preventable. We're here to attempt to decrease that portion number two as well, right? If you injure your knee, you have a cartilage damage or whatever, it is more likely, regardless surgery or not, that you develop arthritis. And sometimes we like to, eh, what I have here, okay, well, I should have never had knee surgery. Right, because now I'm developing arthritis you know, five, ten years later. I said, there's no evidence of that. Right? What, what, what there's plenty of evidence is that whether you had surgery or not, you have an injury to the system. Right? There's a chink in the armor, so the armor's going to work less well. So we want to then take a step back and avoid that at the beginning, and that is another way. Other things that have to do with maladaptive patterns and malalignment have to do with it, et cetera. Genetics is down there. But your end, you know, age does increase our chance of having arthritis, but not what you'd think. Not what you'd think. So we have ability to interact. Mm -hmm. Question about bone density. Uh, there's a, a trainer who, sorry. The question is about bone density. Yeah. And, and a trainer at my gym says that applying resistance uh, is improves bone density and that's important for uh, as you age just to maintain that bone density so that you don't have a slip and fall and you break and then you go downhill fast. How important is it just having sort of a general exercise regime that isn't sports specific or maybe one activity specific for maintaining bone density? Oh. Can you express an opinion on that? Yes, strongly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that is for the most part the trainer's right. There is a law of the body, there's two of them. One is, there are two different people's names and they say this. They say, bone will remodel itself along the lines of the stress that it experiences. It's an automatic machine that's going to adapt to us. So if we do this, sorry for the, if we do that, the bone will adapt along those lines of stress that you're doing by your hopping, okay? Is that good? Sure, right? Because that's gonna alter the bone density and going to improve it. Is that what we should do? No, right? Because we're not hopping unless we're a rabbit, right? So what we need to do is what you kind of said, I think, also in that, is that we need to do all different types of exercise. If we have the same thing, we'll go to the gym and do the same thing every day, it is not going to meet our objective because we need to strengthen those bones. We need to put it in autopilot, and guess what? Same law of the soft tissues. Our muscles, our tendons, our ligaments are doing the same thing. It's on autopilot. So we need to stress them, and we need to stress them in different ways, and it is the single most important way to maintain our bone density and decrease the chance of fracture as we age. No questions asked, by far, and everyone I think would agree on that it's extremely important to stress our bodies in a good way. It makes our bodies efficient, it changes our actual anatomy, and that is very important in resiliency, especially later on in life. 
A um, couple more things. I just want to go through the rest of these, and we're going to keep opening up to questions because this is exactly what this whole session's about right here, just uh, this ability to chat. Um, I just want to show you this potential. These are MRIs, and I don't expect you to ever have seen one before, but this, I just want to show you how dramatic this is when we use the stem cell medicine here, where you see these big cysts, there are these white things that are in the bone, which is otherwise supposed to be black. Do you see that? And even after three months in, in biologic time, that's not much. That's just the beginning of the remodeling and the healing. Do you see how they just disappear, right? Big holes in the bone and the cartilage, and they just, by three months, right? This is by no means fully healed, but it's just powerful. We didn't have this ability to do this previously, so it's a very, very powerful thing. This is the platelet-rich plasma. I just want to make sure everyone ha uh, knows what this is since you hear about it. This is your own blood, by the way, okay, that's taken, and it's prepared in a certain way to get this part out of it. We don't want that, we don't want that, we want that. That contains a lot of growth factors, lots. And, and so what we need is we want to use those factors to biologically enhance our repair, right? Here's the problem. Remember I said it didn't work so great? Here's the problem, this, this is, this is the chemistry, right? And if you really got to and think about it, you say there's all these things in here. This is lots of growth factors, right? It's just way too much. And then there's some of these things that actually make cartilage. They're really good for your body, and you want to inject those things, right? But the problem is when you inject this PRP, you inject all these things. These are opposite. These are those little growth factors that don't make cartilage. And we can do the same thing with muscle. We can do the same thing with bone, tendon, whatever. But we've got to sort this out because this isn't working. And so what we're doing here at Stanford is to saying, OK, well, we can make this stuff but we're going to eliminate this stuff because this stuff is the thing that doesn't work. So then we can evaluate this and see how it works. And ah, all right, here's now tissue-specific regeneration. We could do more things than we did before because we're changing the recipe of this. And so here is just the cartilage production for sake of argument, right? And you see how different it is from standard recipe versus new recipe. It's not ready for prime time yet, but boy, are we close, and this is exciting, right? This is the differences of how biologics are going to be in the future and how we can even take something that's so powerful, such as the stuff from our human body, and make it better than our current practice. So in summary, our whole understanding of training and of injury prevention has changed in the last five years. We have documented evidence of how this change is a good thing. Right? And this stems from the football program or from the performance of US athletes. I don't care how you measure it. It's totally different now, but in a very good way. We are now much more resilient athletes with a markedly decrease of having an injury. And that is important. And we're stronger now because we're stronger now and not just hopping up and down, but in multiple directions. And that's the key. And the good news is now sports medicine has really got to that, that, that point, the plateau here, where we now have an understanding. We're optimizing things. It's a great time. We have lots of new choices on the things that we can use to regenerate our body. But here's the most important part, I, I think, point of it all. This is all from our own body's cells. And if you want to just talk, hey, is this going to work or whatever, the biggest part of that is safety. Right? Safety. Am I going to reject this? Do I have to have a bunch of medications? Because no. This is your own tissue. And that's where this whole pendulum is going uh, in the future. So um, uh, one, uh, two reminders. Number one, um, after we're done with uh, uh, chatting, uh, then what we'll do is that we have plenty of time uh, that for those trainers out there. And if you want to look at your symmetry and balance and strength, go for it. Um, and it's free of charge, and they'll be out there for you, and just look hard for the signs. Um, second is this, this book we put together. Most of you have it on the way in. If you haven't, feel free to. This is written in a different way. This isn't a medical textbook, deliberately, right? This is to understand, in more of common terms, how to really go about an exercise regimen. This is written, <laughs> as we were talking about a long time ago, so some of the training techniques are not quite up to date on what it is, but it's very useful, I think. And especially because we have kids, or we know families with kids, and people get injured, and you get injured, and how we could just look something up and say, well, how is this typically taken care of, and how serious is this? And it gives us a little bit of a heads up. Then we say, OK, let's get into that emergency room now. Or, OK, 
here's a reasonable way uh, to take care of this in the most likely scenario. So it's set up as a quick reference guide for you guys to use uh, as time goes on. So make sure you get a copy by the, uh, by the end. So thank you very much. How much time overall do we have in this session? Six minutes? Five, eight minutes? Okay. So more questions. Uh -huh. Single one of my friends who's 40 years old and older has been injured doing CrossFit. Yes. And I just want to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, they're trying to pressure me, you got to do CrossFit, you got to yeah. do CrossFit. And I'm like, I, I don't want to be injured. Yeah. And, you know, part of it seems like trainers over pushing these yeah. weekend warrior athletes. Yeah. Um, that, that to me is the, the basic nutshell of it. What do you think about CrossFit and is there? Is there such thing as safe CrossFit? Yes, yes. And so, so CrossFit, well, I kind of showed you that one maneuver. Remember the woman were holding a kettlebell? That's a CrossFit type of program. Here's the problem. The problem tends to be CrossFit prescription. Here's the uh, CrossFit um, agenda for today. Here's what we're going to do as far as this to compete and to get you ready. Well, maybe two in the group is, is ready for that. But the others need to just get started on those movement patterns. We're not competing. We're not all in the same weight group, and we're not all at the point of doing those exercises together. That's the problem. CrossFit is great when you are ready for the high demands of advanced CrossFit training. But you can't start with advanced cross training. It's very multidimensional. It's very taxing to your tissues which is ultimately the great thing, right, a previous question, right, the great thing we have going for us with CrossFit. You cannot start there, though. So you would then have to have an instructor that understands this. It's going back uh, to that thing. Is that, OK, we have everyone on the group. We're going to see where you're at. You do this. You do this. You do this. And eventually, we're going to get there. And then we're going to have a much less chance of getting injured. Matter of fact, we're going to have way less chance of getting injured, because that's a preventative technique to, to to ward off injuries doing other things. But at the beginning, we've got to watch it. And that's the problem. Sir, yes. You talked about the multi-directional movements. And you know, I, I try to do that through a lot of trail running, uh, CrossFit, uh, boot camp, yep. mountain biking kind yeah. of stuff. But what, what is the role of flexibility and trying to improve flexibility? Because I've heard that if you routinely stretch after you're warmed up, you, you gradually you'll loosen up uh, your muscle fibers, even if you're a t tight person. It's down on the list, to be honest with you. And the question is flexibility. Um, what you need to do is become symmetric. And some body parts, um, some body types are not as flexible. But every study that's been done with regards to flexibility has been disappointing in it it its ability to prevent injury. The most disappointing thing is stretching before your activity. I could go to the, be pretty dogmatic in 2015 and says it just doesn't work. Don't spend your time doing it. Okay? Never been shown to do anything, to be honest with you. But what has happened is this called active integration or, uh, or warming up through dynamic exercise. Don't start sprinting, but warm up in multiple dimensions. That has been shown to improve. And stretching afterwards probably has its place. But its place is getting your body right. So when you do it, you're not favoring sides. So you're not limited as far as a movement of your left shoulder when you're doing your movements, because that's going to predispose you to injury. It's not that overall you're so much more flexible that that is that key quintessential thing that's going to pr protect you. Make sense? So yes and no. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah, actively integrating the movements that you're going to be doing for the day. Um, if you're going to be jog, you slowly jog. You jog in multiple dimensions. You do multiple different uh, types of movements. Um, you're playing tennis. You want to do, again, movements with your hips. You want to do some side to side uh, movements. I mean, that's something. It's a great question. That's worth you going to a exercise fitness uh, uh, expert and say, how do I just warm up? I mean, what a great question that is. What do you do? OK, here is a, here's a good warm up regimen. Hard to generalize, because we want specific things that's going to help you warm up for the thing you're doing, right? But it's in multiple dimensions. It's slow, right? It's exaggerated movements. You're going through more movements than you would with your sport, because you're preparing your body to do that. Yes? Uh, 
um, the, 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 so what, what research options, uh, trials are promising for osteoarthritis of the knee? Well, to be honest with you, stem cells. I, I think that's that thing. That's that thing when arthritis gets to a certain point, um, there's not a whole lot of things besides putting metal and plastic. So if we're going to regenerate, it's going to have to be a big thing. Uh, we have to do major things to do that. The second is the understanding that osteoarthritis is very different in different individuals. A recent understanding. We went through medical school. They stood up at the front and say, okay, osteoarthritis is a non-inflammatory disease of thinning of your cartilage. Wrong. And we were misled right from the beginning. Yeah, so, so it's not the case in at least probably 50% of the folks. And the question is, well, if you have an inflammatory component to arthritis, you should be treated differently. We should be treating the inflammation. If you have stiffness that is involved with your osteoarthritis and limitations of your movement, you should treat, be treated differently. And then to think that stem cells are going to work for all those things, a dream, not going to happen, right? So we need to understand that arthritis is not arthritis. There's lots of different things to consider. And we, as our side, need to, to understand that it's much more widespread and we, can't, we have to have multiple ways of treating the different folks and their type of arthritis. Different things um, help different types of arthritis. Quick question. Um, the CRP, or uh, PRP, PRP yes. sorry. So I'm just nervous about that. So you take, to sh you take my blood, yes. and then you continue to create more with my specific blood, or do you need a lot of blood if there's multiple things? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because there's so little that's taken. Yeah, and so little blood taken, too. Yes. Oh. Okay. So, so what we're we're doing is we're taking a very. If you um, if you ever have donated blood, we would never take anywhere even within fifty percent of that blood that you would have for a blood draw. This is really small, and if you guys want to measure it, uh, we measure it in cc's, and um, so around between ten and sixty cc's. If you want to go put in a measuring uh, thing, it's it's not very much. Um, and so it's a very minimal blood draw. And then we use that because it's very concentrated to do a lot of things. So we don't keep going back and getting more and more blood. It's just one, one small little blood draw. We don't keep growing it, in a sense. Against the, law, against the rules of the FDA, we cannot do that. You can go over to Europe, and then they can incubate it with a special factor overnight. But uh, don't spend your money on that either, right? No evidence to suggest that that works. But no, in the United States, okay. that's what you get. And we can further take things out. Okay. Um, but what we can't do is add things in and take it out of the, the uh, out of the operating room or the clinic and do something with it and come back the next day to do it against FDA rules. Thank you, ma'am. Multiple knee injuries, and so I'm wondering how much pain do I need to be in before I do something about it, and is it going to be uh. covered by insurance or not? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. so the question is uh, multiple knee injuries and now developing some pain. The question is, when do I seek care uh, for, uh, for that? And, um, and the second question is, if I need to seek care, will it be paid for by insurance? And uh, let me flip and say the insurance part first. It depends on your insurance. I, I would love to generalize insurance and say yes, no, whatever, but it is all over the map. Um, for the most part, you have an injury. Almost all insurances would pay for that. It's the reason you have, right? If something happens to you, it's the reason. The, the part, maybe we can tease out, the part that some insurances pay for is preventative care. If nothing's really going on, how do I, do I go to the doctor to prevent it? Well, heart disease and everything, yes, it pays for. Physical medicine, some of them, yes. Some of them, no. Um, what is too much pain? I have injuries. It's what we've been talking about. When the body tends to degenerate, there is very difficult to go back. So if there is something wrong earlier in the cascade of events that's going on, we're better off treating and identifying things earlier in the onset of injury than later. That being said, most injuries it happen, and six weeks later, it's gone. Right? So, yeah, I'm not going to the doctor. Or people end up canceling. I was really hurt, and six weeks later, I'm not going to keep that appointment. So, so there, that's reasonable, I think, right? Because the body does have regenerative capacity. So there's nothing wrong with giving a little bit of time. What's reasonable? Six weeks maximum time, somewhere between three and six weeks from an injury. See how this goes. See if it's going to calm down. Feel free, I guess, if you want to take an anti-inflammatory over-the-counter medication, if you would like. But 
But then when we get to six weeks and like, this is still with me, this, I'm not saying six months, I'm not saying a year, that is when we get into the danger zone. Now if you ask for disasters that come in the clinic, oh boy, if we could only seen you six months ago. Those, those reactions from your physician, you don't want that, right? Because there is a chance, there's an opportunity, so we would want that sooner than later. So here, here's the, the summary. Summary is I will be available for you. We have another session that's coming up uh, here, and so we'll have to change. I'll have to leave, and I'll be right outside, maybe in the central por uh, part here, to answer the rest of the questions you have. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming, and feel free to go to the booth uh, for the function meeting. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.